welcome to our session on game making. Now in this session we're going to explore um, a number of concepts related to computer games in a bit more detail. So the first is a conceptual framework called secondary worlds and with this goes the process of co-creation. We're going to discuss what these mean. And then we're going to look at some virtual worlds and the idea of a special subset of computer gaming being around um, online multi-user virtual environments they are called virtual worlds. And we're also going to look at a specific computer game simulation that's used in education um, known as Sim School. So, First off, let's have a look at this concept of secondary worlds. Now, in the course material, there's two digital texts that I've made available for you. One on um, secondary worlds and computer gaming, and the other on virtual worlds. So if you have access to a Apple system and can use the iBooks um, it's a little bit more interactive and you can access the video clips that are embedded within the document. Otherwise, there's the PDF version, which you can use to access the text and images associated with the document. So in the first document, um, the one on educational gaming, uh, the first few chapters go through material that we've already covered looking at the concept of play and gamification and things of that nature. But chapter four introduces the idea of secondary worlds. And that's what I wish to explore with you in this session. So the idea of secondary worlds um, comes from an author, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was also a researcher and was exploring the nature of myth and how it relates to storytelling or um, particularly grand narratives around um, the creation of mythologies. So in uh, Tolkien's work on secondary worlds, he introduces this concept and essentially it relates to the idea that we have a primary world which is the real world as we know it and when people create stories and uh, myths and so forth they create secondary worlds which often have similarities to the primary real world that can also have significant differences so for example in his own literary works he created the secondary world of Middle Earth and it was populated with fantastic um, races and beasts, elves and dwarves and hobbits and things of that nature. But it also had people and it had towns and interactions and global politics and so forth, which drew a lot upon the primary world. So it wasn't completely fanciful. It had a lot of elements that we could relate to as we relate to things in the real world. But it also had a lot of additional things which made it a secondary world and it was also made by someone from the primary world that's why it's called a secondary world a derivative world now many authors particularly in fantasy and science fiction have created such worlds um, and it's sort of a, a hallmark of that of those particular genres so we can think of them as being somewhat parallel in that what we will find in a secondary world will often contain elements from the primary world, but in not as much detail. And in fact, very few authors go to the detail that Tolkien did um, in creating a secondary world that was as rich and, and as detailed in terms of its complexity as we find in his stories and subsequent movies and other associated works. So why is it important? Well, 
a lot of fantasy and science fiction involves what we call suspension of disbelief, where we immerse ourselves in this in the narrative of this new environment, and we pretend to ourselves that it is real. Now we know it's not truly real, but in order to to engage with it fully, we suspend our disbelief that it's not real, and we accept that it. It could be real. It's got enough elements in there that we can relate to it and that we can engage with it. Now, in order for that to occur, the world needs to be of sufficient complexity and depth that we can believe that it is real. Even though knowing that we accept that it's not real, that we can pretend in our belief that it is real. So in order for that to be assisted, the world needs to be complex enough. It has to have enough backstory that we can accept that it's not just a two-dimensional caricature of something. Now Tolkien um, developed three levels of approaching this. The first is the philosophic level. This is where the, the world has a philosophically um, complex backstory such as having gods and a mythology. Um, where did the world come from? Where did the universe of this secondary world come from? Um, who created it? Um, at that sort of mythological level. Then we have what's called the epic level. So we often have stories set within the secondary worlds. That's generally how we engage with them. There are various storytelling narratives or um, poems or um, movies set within a secondary world and these are often maintained within an epic narrative some sort of good versus evil um, nations versus other nations some sort of big picture um, processes occurring within the secondary world and then we have the naive level and this gets down often to individuals or small groups where they're interacting with the world and having to travel from one place to another place, um, meeting people, engaging with conversations and having quests and adventures set within the secondary world. And all three of these contribute towards that suspension of disbelief. And they're all necessary to different degrees in order for us to accept the secondary world as a as a possible, um, a possible substitute for the real world in our explorations and our narrative um, journey within this world. So what does that have to do with games? Well, computer games and games in general often draw upon the rich, um, rich storytelling of fantasy and science fiction and the secondary worlds that have been created in um, particularly novels and movies and so forth are often translated into computer games. Now as computer games have developed as a genre um, there are now computer games that are being developed uh, without the need for um, novels and so forth to support them. They're of sufficient complexity in their own development that they're now spawning their own novels and their own movies and so forth. Um, but initially, computer games um, were generally derived from existing storytelling and, and mythologies and, and so forth. Now, the big aspect of computer games, though, is around the interaction. And generally, in a movie or in a novel, you experience it as directed by the author or the, or the movie maker or the director of the movie. In computer games, while that still is the predominant mode, some computer games allow you to make decisions about what occurs in the game. Now, at the simple level, it's you've got a character that's moving around, and while they're generally following a set narrative, there are decisions about where you move and what you do and the actions that you perform, much more so than occurs when you're reading a book or watching a movie. 
So there's that level at the naive level of being able to make decisions and have things occur um, through your interactions and your initiative. Some computer games, though, also take you to the epic level, uh, particularly games where you're running a country or um, and you're building a nation or building a city and then it might be having wars or other cities and things are happening on a much grander scale. And then there are a few games, though they are very much the rarity, where you can start looking at the philosophical level. And these sometimes occur in uh, large multiplayer online games where the players themselves start developing their own nations and their own myths. Um, various players in the past have done great epic things that for, are comprised of the mythology of the game. Um, various clans and organizations within the game form their own nations and this all builds a much larger backstory and mythology um, that encompasses the game itself. So gameplay and game development can build upon these ideas of secondary worlds and the concept of co-creation. This is where we actually contribute to the game. Now in novels, this happens a little bit where we have authors write a novel and then other authors may come along and write other novels that extend upon the narrative. Um, a lot of science fiction uses this particular approach, um, say Doctor Who, you've got the original, <coughs> original author of Doctor Who, and then you've got then lots of subsequent authors that have written new episodes and adventures set within the original framework defined by the original author. And similarly, the Star Wars universe has had um, thousands of books written set within the, um, the environment created by the original authors, but they're then able to add to that. Um, they were able to co-create. Um, now, it's also extended beyond that, not just to professional authors, but there's a whole um, movement around what's called um, where we have people contributing their own stories. Um, uh, they're making their own narratives and player or um, fan contributions and we call it um, fan publishing and it's a way of anyone being able to contribute to the original setting of the world and build upon that. And there are some organizations that try to guide that process. At the moment, Disney, having bought the rights to Star Wars, is having taken strong efforts to um, redirect uh, fan fiction, which was expanding out upon the Star Wars universe. And there is a concept of what's called um, what is going to be allowed within the authorized narrative of the Star Wars universe and is then built upon in subsequent um, authorized publications and what fans have contributed and produced. Now in terms of computer games, this is also something that is starting to be utilized. Now we have some games which are called sandbox games um, where it is based upon this concept. Minecraft is probably the, the main example. The basic Minecraft game has got a very, very bland environment. It's mostly wilderness, um, a few isolated sort of um, towns and so forth, but they're very basic and so forth. And there is a general narrative around this other world that people can get to and so forth. But in the main, there's not much storytelling. The storytelling is done by the players. They build things, they go on quests, they um, create adventures, they invite their friends in to explore the world and to build on the world themselves. And they're building out that particular um, co-creation. And there are other games that do this to lesser and greater extents, particularly the, the multiplayer games 
often have it built into the mechanics, um, but often not so much in terms of changing the world itself, but in terms of building guilds and um, having players self-organise how they're going to interact with the world. But there are some games where players do build as a central component, um, building cities or space empires and yeah. things of that nature. And that does then relate to a yeah. more specific co-creation process. So some aspect of computer games popularity can be seen around this nature of secondary world co-creation, where the ability of players to do more than just experience a narrative that has been created by the author or the movie producer, but to actually interact with the narrative, to change the narrative as they play and make decisions about what is going to occur in the secondary world, is a significant aspect of why computer games are popular. So within that process, we can then look at how education can utilize secondary worlds and this concept of co-creation as part of um, improving the learning experiences of students when they utilize computer games. Now, one process of this is called mental models. This is where we build a, an understanding of a concept and our mental model is by necessity a simplification of a real world experience or real world concept. We might build a mental model of um, Australia's geography, where the states are, um, where the capital cities are, things of that nature. And that gives us a good understanding of how they are in relation to one another. But it's nowhere near as detailed as the reality of things in the real world geography. But it is our own secondary world of where things are in relation to each other. Likewise, you build mental models of, of all sorts of things. A mental model of social interactions, say of how our friends interact with one another, how we make friends and how we have enemies and things of that nature. Or how the economy works. We have a mental model of the complexities involved in the economic processes. Nowhere near as complex as the real world processes, but sufficient for us to have an understanding of being able to buy things and sell things and save and make purchases and maybe invest some money and things of that nature. So we build these mental models all the time and they really do represent secondary worlds. They are a simplified subset of the real world and they have certainly elements of the real world, but they can also have other elements. And we can also introduce fantasy elements and this is particularly useful in education, where if we're trying to explain and understand some complex concepts, let's say the issue of genocide. Now, genocide is a pretty horrific sort of thing to explore in terms of its real world um, examples. But if we simplify that and say, look at, okay, what would happen if we had these characters in a fictional um, game environment? And one group of characters was trying to destroy the other group so that they could take their land and explore that. And so we could explore the, the concept of genocide without having to go into the real world complexities and implications of that exploration. Um, just one example. There's lots of things that we can use fantasy elements to. Um, even such things such as physics and mathematics where we can build this idea of, well, one example in mathematics was the concept of flat world, where we had um, creatures in two dimensions. Um, they didn't have three dimensions. They always had to move around in a two dimensional plane and how that they would run into other two dimensional objects and interact with them. And if a three dimensional object was um, placed in the two dimensional world, what would the two dimensional object uh, people see they would see an intersection of that three-dimensional object. Now, a fantastic tool for teaching about geometry and topology and all, all those mathematical concepts, but done through a secondary world and a game-like environment. So education can certainly utilize secondary worlds, and we can do it again at the three different levels. 
at the naive level, we're looking at simple problems that are being trying to be solved and how we can make direct simulations and get a specific understanding about uh, very simplistic processes. So one computer game would have been Lemonade Stand, where it's teaching students about um, commerce, uh, how much money they're going to spend on sugar and on lemons and on water, and how they combine those and what price they then have to sell it for in order to ensure they make a profit. And then it introduced other things such as temperature um, and whether or not it was raining or sunny, and that in impacted the price. And that was about the complexity of the game. But it was very useful in teaching students some fundamental concepts around saving and com commerce, the idea of profit margins, um, the idea of variability, and the fact that we have to make sure that we uh, have enough profit to get us through the good times and the bad times and things of that nature. But then we have more complex games, such as at the epic level, we could be looking at concepts that involve multiple mental models where we've got to introduce a whole range of different complex ideas in order to understand how the game works. Um, so an example of that would be SimCity, where we, we were trying to run a city. Part of that is looking at the sewage system, part of it is looking at the transport system, uh, part of it the employment system, uh, the jobs, the different types of industries that are going to be um, available in the, in the town, how to look after um, disaster management, uh, the education system. All reasonably complex concepts that involve degrees and expertise in their own individual areas that simplified and placed within a secondary world that the students can engage with and understand the processes happening and build a more complex model of how these things interact at an epic level. And then you have the philosophic level and this is where we start trying to look at moral and religious issues and ethical issues um, looking at some games where there are decisions made as to whether or not to steal or to injure other players or uh, characters in the game. Um, when is it right to invade or not invade? Um, what are the consequences of those? Um, so there's a whole range of different other aspects that can be taught and learnt through the secondary worlds of computer games that would be more difficult to engage with in other processes. Now that said, there are a range of different types of gamers, and we call these taxonomies. Um, not everyone engages with every sort of game. Some people like action and adventure type games. Some people like strategic games, some like puzzle games. Just as we have people liking action adventure movies, some people like um, complex drama movies, some people like mystery movies. And we have similar sort of interests and taxonomies within computer gaming. And within that, then, we have particular genres of gamers and game interactions. As I said, some people like playing individually. Some people like playing in groups. Some people like the social interactions. Some people like the individual challenges and, and trying to beat themselves. Um, some like investigating and understanding the mechanics and the processes involved. Some people like uh, manipulating the systems and players and um, processes within a game. Some like strategizing and looking at the big picture processes. Some like just simple comp competition and um, trying to beat this, either the system or other players. So these are all complex aspects of game um, gaming types and different games have got different affordances around these processes. Now, within education, there's a process called um, uh, PCK, um, which is an alignment between pedagogy, um, the content being taught, and ensuring that the pedagogy matches the content. Now, this has been expanded to a concept called TPAC, which looked at the technology, the pedagogy and the content, and acknowledging that there are certain technologies that support certain pedagogies and certain technologies that support certain um, content learning, um, technologies to assist in the teaching of drama, 
may very well be different to the technologies that would assist in the teaching of mathematics. And likewise, technologies that would assist in um, teaching through project-based learning would be different to the technologies that would assist in, the, in um, direct instruction. So you've got this mix and the best learning occurs when the three align. Now, if we replace um, the technology in this case with computer games, we want to ensure that the computer game aligns with the pedagogy and the content being taught. But the other aspect of computer games, relating back to what we were talking about taxonomies, is that we also want to make sure that the, the game pedagogy and content also align with students' interests around different types of, of games. Um, and where all four of those align is when the best possible learning experience is likely to be occurring. Okay, so that's some theoretical elements of uh, computer games and how they relate to the concept of secondary worlds and how we can better use computer games in education when we understand this concept of co-creation and the importance of co-creation um, to support students' engagement with gaming as a genre. Now, one subset of computer games is the idea of virtual worlds. So virtual worlds is the other digital text that I've provided you with. And And these allow us to engage in a digital space using avatars, which are 3D representations of ourselves, moving around a virtual world or virtual environment. Now, this is a picture of some of my students sitting around a virtual table, having a discussion in an online course. Um, my avatar is there on the left in the zebra um, suit. And this is a virtual world that I created many years ago now for Griffith University in an environment called Second Life, where we had a wilderness theme um, that set within this space was a range of different learning interactions and um, lecture theatres and tutorial spaces um, set more within an environmental context rather than a other sort of a context in this case. So secondary worlds, sorry, virtual worlds, um, can represent a secondary world. It's again a simplified environment where we can move around and interact with one another, but it has the affordances of a online space where we can access it remotely. Um, some students find the avatars um, more effective than video conferencing because the avatar is a simplified representation of themselves. Um, at the moment, avatars are not particularly expressive. Um, they can generally move their arms and legs and heads in different directions, but they, in the main, don't have facial expressions. Now, with the reemergence of interests and technologies around virtual reality, they're now building cameras into virtual reality headsets to pick up on facial expressions. And we're now starting to see avatars being able to express um, our facial movements. So this is taking um, avatar interaction to another level, um, which will hopefully improve processes. The other approach that's been used is to have the avatars have a uh, video screen in, in place of their head or their face and have a real world video streaming of your um, normal video face onto the avatar. Um, so it allows you still to move around, but you can then also pick up on visual cues of interacting with someone through looking at their facial features. So secondary worlds were very popular, sorry, virtual worlds were very popular um, in the 90s and early 2000s. But then they started fading away from popularity. Um, we tended to move more towards video conferencing. Of course, it was starting to allow um, greater interactions. 
and because of the lack of facial features, um, secondary worlds were not seen as quite as interactive as video conferencing. But that said, video, um, virtual worlds do allow a range of different possibilities that are not achievable through video conferencing. Mostly in the settings that can be created, the virtual spaces. Um, and just like in computer games, where we can have virtual spaces that we can move characters around and, and engage with those virtual spaces as if they were secondary worlds, so too we can have virtual spaces in virtual worlds. And we can then utilize those for education. So one example here in the banner is one done for NASA. Um, and every rocket that's ever been launched is available in simulated real scale in, in terms of the scaling to the avatars. And you can uh, climb around them and go inside them and fly around them. Another advantage of virtual worlds is that you can not just limited by the laws of physics. You can teleport, you can fly, you can do other things that are not necessarily um, easily achievable in the primary world, the, um, the real world. So other things that were made in secondary worlds, oh, sorry, in virtual worlds, um, most commonly were uh, historical spaces, such as the Parthenon or the Colosseum, um, the Great Barrier Reef was created. Um, the pyramids, things of that nature, things that were difficult to actually travel to and explore and experience in the real world, but could be achieved in virtual secondary worlds. But the big aspect of most virtual worlds, though, was they also allow multi multiplayer interactions, where we could interact with one another, talk to one another, go collectively together and do things which was generally different to many computer games although the multiplayer online computer games are sort of in that space as well and indeed probably the largest virtual world is one called club penguin which is aimed for um, early primary year stu students and involves a whole lot of really simple little games and quests but there would be commonly hundreds of thousands of players within that environment at any one time. Now, just as an aside, another aspect of computer games and virtual worlds is a concept called Mishimina. This is where we use the avatars and the settings of a virtual space or a computer game to create our own narratives and our own, essentially our own movies. Um, so using a space of say um, Shakespeare's Globe Theatre and then using avatars that are dressed in the characters of various Shakespearean characters going setting them within the Shakespearean Globe Theatre virtual space and performing the plays as they would be performed um, in terms of the dimensions of the space um, as they were intended to in the Globe Theatre which was very different to most uh, conventional theatres. Now, they don't have to be just done for that, though. Um, indeed, Mishimina has been very popularized in um, using computer games. So one computer game is called um, Halo, which is a space first person shooter combat game. Now, it has characters that can move around and have very, very simplistic expressions because they're all wearing helmets. Um, but through the use of humor and the use of the placement of these characters, they have a dialogue with one another and it's recorded and they're then shared on YouTube um, and there are tens of thousands of them that have been shared and are very, very popular. Um, simply as little sort of quips and little um, interactions where they discuss something and make jokes and stuff like that. Um, very short and very um, specific to uh, a particular topic. but they proved very, very popular. A little bit like GIFs are proved popular with um, images and so forth. Uh, because of the short nature of them and the um, intrinsic humor that's being able to be applied very quickly, uh, they've proven quite popular. But they've also been used to good effect in education, where we often want students to make short little um, 
instructions or explanations of a concept and creating a Mashimana explanation has proven quite popular, uh, particularly with gamers. Uh, if you've got students that are gamers, having their favorite characters explaining how gravity works or the concept of mitosis in, in biology or things of that nature. So it's allowing them to use a fun, engaging environment and tool to, for educational purposes. So there are a range of virtual world platforms. As I mentioned, Second Life has been by far the most popular and the largest, although it's now being challenged by um, a new push towards the metaverse um, and their use of virtual reality he helmets and augmented reality um, devices to allow greater interaction between um, the avatars in, this, in the virtual worlds. But Secondary Life had problems. It was a proprietary environment that cost money to purchase things and to build. Um, and so it, over time, uh, limited its own success. And eventually people moved away from using it as a, um, a widespread environment. There was an attempt to develop open, free environments, uh, the open sim movement, um, whereby people could host their own virtual worlds and interact within those. And there have been a range of those that have been developed. Active Worlds is one, Open Wonderland, Open Cobalt, and there's been um, another dozen or so since those in the last few years. But one of the biggest that was used for education was developed by, by academics, but in conjunction with teachers, and it was called Quest Atlantis. And at its height, it ran for about a dozen years, it had um, tens of thousands of students interacting with um, what were called quests, which were basically learning activities where they would learn a concept. But it might be a concept in music or geography or maths or English, and there were um, several thousand quests, including a um, hundred or so Australian ones that were developed by Australian educators. And the students, the teachers would bring the students into the environment they would complete the quests and they were very specifically focused around learning about particular concepts. And it was a safe environment. Um, it was set up with lots of checks and balances. Only students could get in there and there were ongoing monitoring of their discussions and conversations to ensure that there was an appropriate environment for young children to be engaged with, which is one of the biggest challenges with virtual worlds and also with open online games. Um, because they're designed to be uh, commercially viable. Um, they allow anyone to utilize the environments and sometimes people utilize them for inappropriate uses. That was one of the biggest problems with um, Second Life. It was very, very popular and became quite popular with adult entertainment as a specific um, subset of users, which was somewhat challenging for educational uses in that space. Um, there were attempts to make a um, 18, uh, an under 18s only environment and things of that nature, but it never really um, took off in that space effectively. Now, this again is a challenge for the emerging virtual worlds, the metaverse, uh, particularly in terms of educational uses, um, where it can be open and used by lots of people. There will be people that use it for particular purposes that are not necessarily compatible with most, particularly K-12 education. Um, and that's an ongoing issue with that space. Uh, but at, um, Quest Atlantis was um, reinvented as Atlantis Remixed, an attempt to keep it going, but um, it hasn't really taken off again as a popular educational space. So, Within those, the last aspect I wanted to let you explore is an idea or a particular um, computer simulation called Sim School. Uh, where are 
we go. Okay. Now I've given you access to a certain level of Sim School. Unfortunately, full access is not currently available. Um, but the idea of Sim School is it allows you to simulate a classroom environment. And I use this in particular for teacher education. Because again, it is a secondary world. It's a simplification of the real world complexity of a normal classroom. So we can have just a single student, or we can have a two or three students, or a class of 20 or 30 students. Um, and we can increase the difficulty of the simulation by increasing the number of students. But we can also delve into what happens with those students in great detail. Um, the teacher playing the simulation chooses the activities and interactions they have with the students and can then see the impact they have on the students in terms of their attention, their engagement with the activity, the learning that's occurring um, in various cognitive domains and so forth. And I in particular utilize the simulation to help students understand the importance of differentiation, how every student is different and what works with one student might necessarily work with all students. And so as they try different educational pedagogies um, and they see the impact it has and the fact that it works on certain students because of certain things and it doesn't work on other students because of other things. And that allows them to have a better understanding of differentiation in terms of the concept being explored by Sim School. However, my colleagues also use it for other purposes. Um, particularly in the United States, they use it a lot for the, um, the concept of bias. Um, so you've got your students and some of them are female and some of them male, some of them of different ethnic groups. And they then look at students running a class and then they unpack how much interactions the teacher had with different students. Did they pay attention to girls as much as boys or to different ethnicities? Or were the students that were um, most seeking attention, the ones that they gave all of their attention to and not those that were quietly failing in the back? And by using this, they're able to explore their own teaching practice and unpack how they interacted with the students in the simulation. So again, it's an example of a secondary world. It's a simplification of the real world that allows the um, students in this case to explore what happens in a classroom environment from a different perspective. Whereas if they were simply observing the real world classroom, um, the complexity of that classroom can often overwhelm the nuances that we're trying to have them understand and unpack. So that's an examination of game making from a perspective of understanding the mechanics of secondary worlds and of simulations and of virtual worlds. And we'll explore these in some more detail during the tutorials.